Good day and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Russell Hendrickson. I'm the CEO here at Practical Data Solutions. I'm pleased to have joining me today, Caitlin Stillwell. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. So for those joining for the first time, welcome to PDS. We are a healthcare analytics company and our goal is to provide our customers with the tools and knowledge to gain better insight into how to use their data as well as to help them drive change within their organization. And that's what today's webinar, Cultivating a Data-Driven Culture, is all about. And Caitlin, I, I noticed as we were practicing earlier today, they're cultivating that tree there with data analytics. So I guess obviously the our graphics person understood that uh, that analogy. I didn't pick up on that at first. I just thought they were they were trying to grow their organization or something. Very clever. <laughs> So business users, you know, today we live in the world where, you know, AI is sort of the, the popular topic, you know, and we expect answers literally in seconds, you know, so people want analytics and data to be able to run their healthcare organization. They want to be able to have tools at their fingertips. They want the training and the support. Of course, they want it fast. One of our clients used to say 2.2 seconds. If it takes any longer than that, you know, it's too slow. They want it secure. We've got to worry about HIPAA privacy. Of course, if we're building new analytics or delivering new dashboards, we want it on time and we want it under budget. And so, you know, it might be something like, hey, let's look at patient satisfaction data. Let's understand, you know, how our patients are viewing our physicians or our practice or the care they received in the hospital. So we need to be able to have access to, you know, what patients are saying. From a productivity side, we want to understand and be able to, you know, understand our financial performance, be it, uh, you know, RVUs if we're in the practice or the charge lag or charges, payments, collections, length of stay. We want to be able to measure productivity metrics very quickly and easily. And then, of course, you know, we might want to understand what's the impact on patients scheduling appointments, patients being able to get in, how long are we spending on the telephone, um, what what is physician availability, but it's not enough just to run a bunch of reports. Organizations want to be able to put all of this data together very quickly. They want to be able to analyze key relationships, be able to blend data and start to infer information that if they were just running different reports, they can't do, you know, where you can start to understand the relationship between, you know, um, how easy it is for a patient to get an appointment and the availability in the schedule with patient access. So by blending data, we can start to gather and gain better insights into what's going on in the organization, which is what we're going to talk about today. And of course, you know, finally, organizations, they want to be able to publish it out as a dashboard. They want to be able to click a button or click on a web link or have it show up in their email or alerted that there's a problem or an area that needs focus on. So people want it at their fingertips. They want it blended. They want it fast and they want it easy. That's exactly true. And I'm sure we've all come to know that there's a lot of data within the healthcare space. So we have from clinical data and patient satisfaction scores to managing physician scheduling and tracking our budget against our revenue and expenses, we have to ask, how do we make sense of all that data? And that's exactly what we're going to work through on today's webinar. We'll get a better idea of what it means to be data-driven, and we'll learn the meaning behind analytical intensity and how when we actually evaluate and improve upon our current analytic strategies, we can develop a data-driven culture that maximizes our ROI and helps to clear the way for effective decision-making. So, Russell, what does it mean to be data-driven? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, so being data-driven in a healthcare organization, it's it's on the focus of the continuous, that's key word there, continuous use of data. And we're really trying to apply data to uncover opportunities. And then through uncovering those different opportunities, we can use data to support and improve performance. So it's being data-driven is about understanding what's going on in the organization, not just from what we think is happening, but what does the data tell us? And then how do we use data to continually improve? Data-driven organizations typically invest in analytics, and the word invest is key. They don't see analytics or technology as a cost, but an investment. Their users have access to data on demand quickly, and they can leverage the data they need when it's needed. So, you know, being able to access sort of data real time, they can explore data. They can, for better terms, slice and dice through data, uncover performance gaps, and understand where there's potential opportunity. 
to improve performance. And then they use data. It becomes part of meetings and discussions. If we're going to meet and talk about challenges with patient access, it's not just to say, here's what we think is going on. They bring data. Um, and ultimately, it's striving for this continual improvement that we're not satisfied with our organizational performance. And we're going to use data to help us drive the organization forward to be better from a quality perspective or an operational perspective. Exactly, Russell. And a really big challenge nowadays that many of us are probably um, experiencing or may have experienced is how do we balance our data with the various perspectives throughout our organization to eliminate bias? and eliminate it with regards to how we're utilizing as well as representing our data. So as we see here, there are occasions where patients are telling us what they see is going on either through survey or verbally, uh, which may be in contrast to what physicians and staff are telling us or what their interpretation might be about what's going on. And then we have our data that gives us other measurable facts. So one of the ways we can battle this bias amongst perspectives is to make sure we actually set in place the tools, knowledge, and practice to help move our organization closer to truly being data-driven. Yeah, and so, you know, this this bias, you know, can be with, with foundation or without, but one example might be that if we were to look at the, uh, this is a simple dashboard here, we were to look at the number of inbound calls versus how many were scheduled through the patient portal, we might see that, oh, look, in April, May, and June, we've got more volume coming through our patient portal. This is great. We've been encouraging patients to you know, schedule their own appointments, cutting down on call volume. But if we only looked at this one metric, you know, how many patients are using the portal, we might think, well, this is great. Our call volumes must be down. Yet when we put data together and we start to use data, bring data together, we can actually see that call volumes, even though they went down in February, March, and April, have spiked back up. And it may be that we've, we're seeing more patients. It may be that you know, we're growing patients more. It may be that we've got you know, some seasonal uh, challenges going on or such. So without looking at sort of the data to tell the whole story, we might be you know, incorrectly assuming that you know, moving forward with one initiative, like trying to get more patients to schedule for themselves, is having the, you know, the, uh, the desired effect of cutting call volume when in fact it's not. Right. And before we do anything else, um, we need to understand why organizations are not more data driven. So there can be several reasons that we may experience that can impact our organization and prevent us from making changes to drive the forward growth we're looking for. And these can include things from staffing, uh, as well as attaining the proper expertise, budget priorities that may supersede investing in new technology or alter alternative vendors to assist us with our data. And then there's also your culture as a whole within an organization. And these reasons can often prevent this continual improvement that we're striving towards. Yeah, you know, two of the biggest things, we talk to clients all the time and probably the two of the, the biggest ones I hear are staff resources. We'd like to get better analytics, but we just don't have the, the staff to support it. And to me, that's a little bit like a catch-22 because if you had better analytics and some more automation, um, you potentially might need less staff. So there's that, you know, we have to invest to save time. Um, the other thing I'd say about, you know, that in general is, you know, implementing analytics, and we'll talk about this coming up, is, is kind of like climbing the stairs. So even if you're at the bottom rung and you're saying we need some better tools, taking that first step, not waiting until everything's perfect or lined up, you still can start to gain some improvements in the organization. And I would say the same thing is true with budget priorities. We talked about analytics is really an investment. And if you're viewing it more as a cost, you're probably missing the ROI. And we're going to talk about that coming up shortly. You know, ultimately, when we talk about this continual improvement, we have to think, stop thinking we've always done it this way and start thinking, how do we improve the organization and how is data going to help us better manage, pro focus and understand where are there gaps in our performance that we can improve? So let's now look at analytical intensity. And this is, uh, to me, analytically intense is an interesting uh, topic. It's not a new concept. It's actually been around for about 14 or 15 years, but I think it's so critical when we talk about being data-driven because it's really understanding a way to assess how is your organization using data and how is it supporting the organizational growth? So if we wanna be data-driven, 
how do we do some of the higher level things that are going to help us with the biggest performance gains? So a, a very you know simple focus here, when organizations start out in the bottom sort of low analytically intense organizations, they typically, everyone starts with summarizing data. Very simply, how many patients did we see in June? You know, we saw, you know, 326 patients. That's just summarizing. How many charges did we bill? Okay, fairly simple. The next level then is to say, well, how many patients did we see in June and how many patients did we see through January through May? So we can start to see that we're growing our volumes, that our patient volume is growing. Or, you know, how are our charge, charges growing or our, our reimbursement? So we can start to trend metrics. But again, and that's fairly what fairly simple to do. Most organizations are doing this. Um, and it's fairly easy to do because a lot of the sort of canned reporting in the, in the EHRs allow you to do these kinds of reporting. Fairly simple. Where things get a little tougher, and, and from our work here at PDS, we hear all the time, we don't benchmark. So when we start benchmarking and we get some comparative points, that's where we start to see some of the challenges. So let's dig into that topic a little um, further. You know, why should we benchmark? Well, there are plenty of reasons why you should utilize benchmarks. And some of the advantage that advantages that we see can include, you know, adding context to your data, they can be used to assess organizational accomplishments and those opportunities for improvement, as well as uh, decision support for setting short and long-term goals. But unfortunately, despite the many reasons to benchmark, it's definitely not without its challenges. There can be a lot of questions around, you know, what we should be measuring, how to measure it, how to actually integrate benchmarks into our current data sets, as well as how to present them effectively. So it's really telling a story. And one of the biggest ones is that it can be really time consuming in those initial stages if you're not accustomed to benchmarking. Right. Yeah. And that's really, this is again, why a lot of organizations don't benchmark is it's, it may be time consuming to get started, but, but uh, it's, it's really key. Two good places to start. There's internal benchmarks and external benchmarks. And internal benchmarks is probably the best place to start because you're comparing your performance against yourselves, if you will. So how are we performing? Uh, how are the physicians performing in a particular division? Who are the top performers? Who are the bottom performers? What's the average performance in our division? Or how are all the clinics performing on uh, answering the phones in a timely fashion or collecting money at the time of service? So we can create internal benchmarks we're comparing ourselves to ourselves, so it's a level playing field. As we improve our performance, our averages, our benchmarks will, our internal benchmarks will, will improve. Um, so th they can change over time. And they really can even encourage competition, whether it's the bottom performers trying to compete and move up to be some of the top performers, or amongst the top performers, you know, when, when you start rating or benchmarking them against each other, um, you know, that can encourage competition. External benchmarks, you know, can be a little challenging, as we just talked about, but do give us insight into industry standards. They help us understand how we're comparing to the market. What are other organizations doing like us? We may feel we're doing well. We've got great performance. We're monitoring our performance against our goals. But without external benchmarks, we really have no idea if our goals are realistic. So that really gives us that ability to start to compare ourselves to others and even our best performers who may say, well, I'm the best in our organization or we're leading the way in this area with quality of care, um, we can then start to understand what's going on in other organizations to understand where we may want to strive and push ourselves. So it gives us a larger sample or size to compare ourselves to. Yeah, and there are a number of sources that you can look to when you go to adopt benchmarks into your practices. Uh, with internal benchmarking, you can set them at several levels from entity or organizational goals like patient surveys down to department budgets to help guide our contribution margin, for example, as well as individual targets around things like RVU productivity. And then there's also a number of external benchmarks that are uh, readily available and some you can utilize for free like CMS and HFMA. And then there's those you can purchase like MGMA. So our next slide is actually a great example of benchmarking that utilizes the multiple formats of benchmarks we've been reviewing. 
Uh, this is one of our easy to use sample PDS dashboards showing both internal goals as well as some industry benchmarks to help us paint a complete picture around our scheduling operations. Yeah, this dashboard really is designed as a comparative uh, dashboard point. I, I like that um, it's red and green against our internal benchmark. Our internal benchmark here is the goal. So you can quickly see how we're performing on these set of key metrics. The second piece then is you can clearly see the external benchmark of what the industry is saying we should be doing. So we may not be ready to try to strive for that top, uh, what the industry is doing, but we can certainly see how we're performing. In addition, um, we put at the top of the screen the one metric, at least for this month, this quarter, this year, that might be one key area we're trying to improve performance. So we're setting a clear goal, in this case, number of daily appointments per physician. You can see our goal is 18 and we're performing at 23. You know, And so very clearly we can see whether we do this by business unit, by location, but we can start to see and understand how are we measuring up against where we want to be and where the industry says we could be or should be. Right. So let's kind of summarize analytical intensity now with another example, which is let's talk about if we just summarize data and we're looking here at a physician's E&M code distribution, and we're looking at the new patient and the established patients, we can see how is this physician coding um, year to date, okay? But then if we bring in the trend, right, we can do comparative, how are they composed, com how are they coding this year versus last year? And we can start to see that there's been a real shift both in new patient and established patient from uh, level three codes to level four codes. So we might say, well, that makes sense. We're trying to be more focused on quality of care. We're trying to make sure we're treating all of our patients HCCs during every visit. So we would sort of expect that. We say, well, our performance is good. But when we bring in the internal benchmark, we can now potentially compare all the physicians uh, in the same department and say, how do we compare to, how does this physician compare to others? And we could start to see, even though we've improved and we're starting to do more higher level coding, we're not quite where everybody else is in the organization. Now, obviously there's documentation considerations and patient mix, but overall we could start to see, well, we're maybe not where we wanna be compared to our internal benchmark. And then of course we could bring in an external benchmark like the CMS coding values and start to see you know, where does CMS, where does that external benchmark expect that we might be? So very simple way to sort of summarize and understand comparatively summarizing data, trending data, internal benchmark, external benchmark makes it very easy to see. Exactly. And once we've combined those forms of analytical intensity from low to medium that Russell just demonstrated, we're able to gain the ability to complete this um, create this complete picture through a single dashboard. And this will help us tell a story and quickly see potential outliers that may exist. And this is really important for getting our physicians the information that they need and getting it to them quickly. So now that we've worked through those levels of analytical intensity, we can take a look at a higher level of analytical intensity. And we're going to start first with relationship analysis. Russell? Sure. So here we're looking at a interactive visualization dashboard. This is built out of the PDS Empower tool set. And this dashboard isn't really meant to be used um, by a practice, um, but more so to illustrate the, the point that we're gonna make about blending data here. So um, just to share a little bit overview, many of you are using tools like Tableau or Power BI. This is a fully interactive dashboard. Okay. And I can click on and identify if I just want to look at a division, either by charges or work RVUs. The physician list filters as we make changes. If I want to see the highest performers over here on the right, these are all the physicians that are driving a high value of RVUs. Looks like orthopedics is some of the highest. And we've in set an internal benchmark here at 400 RVUs. And so if I click to the left uh, side here and I just highlight a bunch of those values, you can very quickly see which um, physicians and which divisions have a lot of physicians performing at the lower value, okay? Useful tells us something, but then the next question might be, but why are these physicians some of the bottom performers? And of course, what are some of the key drivers of RVUs? Well, let's look at how they're level four coding, what we were just looking at in that other example. 
So if we were to look over here, we can say, let's look at all those bottom performing physicians and let's see who's maybe using very few level four codes. Now, again, if, if we're looking like to like, we, we would expect to see slightly different results. So right here we can see there's a number of physicians that are on the bottom performers and it starts to give us some focus. Maybe this is where we need to focus in on coding. At the same time, we might have physicians that are doing, you know, a reasonable amount of level four coding, yet they're still on the bottom performers. And so we've correlated in how quickly are they turning in their charges. And so we can start to see by looking at those physicians that have long charge lag, where those physicians might sit, right? So we can continue to explore and start to understand what areas might we want to focus in on based on adding coding and charge lags. So we're blending additional data points. Let's take a look now what happens when we add scheduling and appointment data. So now we can actually start to see where the RVUs are down and see where there's low volume of patients, but we can't assume that this is necessarily because of a coding issue, it may actually be part of a volume issue, especially if that physician's schedule is wide open. Another way that we could look at this is if the schedule is fully booked with low RVUs, maybe there's not enough room in the provider's schedule, or perhaps the provider is just taking too long with each of their patients. So this really allows us to tie a story together and make some additional correlations around our provider's performance on a few different levels. So again, sort of rounding out the picture. Next, we're going to blend into this same story here. We're going to blend in what about patient satisfaction scores. And so we've been focused on sort of the, the bottom performance, trying to understand how to drive up performance. But in this case, we might want to look at the top performing physicians that have very low patient satisfaction scores or patient access satisfaction scores. Because even though these are physicians performing on a high end, by correlating in this data, we may actually be creating longer term issues that are driving patients away from our practice or pushing them to specialists outside of the practice because we have long wait times or the patients are just not recommending. So we may even have to reevaluate, you know, are the physicians spending enough time with patients? Right? So by blending that, we can also look at how are our top performers doing to, to look out for different nuances. And if we were to sort of tie it all together into sort of a more finished dashboard, you can see here are the physicians with, that are below our benchmark and work RVUs. We've now built in switches or kind of sliders so I can see which of the bottom performers have you know, long charge lag. I can even see which of the top physicians maybe aren't turning in their charges quickly. So we've made it easy to sort of pull the whole picture together. We did correlate in one other data set. We had a consultant who used to work with BDS quite a bit um, that used this data set extensively. And she said, this is the piece of the puzzle that really helped. Because if we're looking at those bottom performers and we factor in the, how long has the physician been with our organization? It's fairly easy to see. I just got to select it there. It's fairly easy to see that some of these bottom physicians, maybe we have more training. The, the physicians that have been with us only a little bit of time, maybe they need more training versus some of the top physicians that we've been working with and working with, and they've been here a long time. Maybe we need to think about a different approach if we're going to try to improve their performance or if there's a reason to. So kind of tying all the data together, allowing us to explore the data, um, giving us a more complete picture of what's going on in the organization. Great. So now that we've discussed our um, relationship analysis and how that contributes to being data-driven, we can shift to focusing on projecting performance improvements to really begin to quantify the available opportunities. Great. So let's go back to the same dashboard and just go one level further here. And so what we're looking at now is we've calculated, we know where the physicians are performing. We have a benchmark. In order to do this last step, projecting performance, we have to understand or have either an internal or an external benchmark to calculate the performance opportunity. And so what we're really saying here is if we move all of these physicians, all of the physicians that are below our internal goal or benchmark, if we could move them to this point, we can actually calculate or quantify in dollars what that performance improvement is. And so this top 
graph right here is showing us, or um, scattergram is showing us, these are the physicians with the greatest opportunity. So if we just take, say, the top third, you can start to see if we were to move them from here over to the line, how many projected dollars might we improve on? Okay. So it makes it fairly easy to start to quantify. And the reason we can quantify is because we have the ability to measure where are we, where do we want to be, and then we can actually use you know, reimbursement per RVU or a budget per RVU to start to project that performance improvement. Really amazing how we can fit so much information into a single dashboard. But for those that don't have the visualization tools like Power BI or Tableau, you can still build and deliver impactful dashboards using Excel that tell the same story. So here we actually have an Excel dashboard that has very similar data to the visual we were just looking at with Russell. In the bottom left graph, we actually can see how some of our positions are performing below target. And then we have supporting measures or projections along the top of the dashboard that we can use to analyze the impact of moving our positions up within their department, either at 5% RVU increase or moving them up to that department average. And the next dashboard, or sorry, the dashboard we just reviewed is actually a really great way to emphasize the importance of the Pareto principle. So here, if we can quickly identify the bottom 20% of providers and focus on how we can move them up, we typically can yield an 80% performance improvement. So in truth, we don't actually need to look at every single position within our department or the organization and work out how to increase everyone's effort. Rather, we can just focus on those with the greatest amount of opportunity, which will allow us to allocate our resources with greater efficiency overall. So we talked about projecting what is the performance improvement and how does that tie to creating an ROI? Well, if we can calculate what the potential performance improvement is, and then if we were to say, well, you know, realistically, if we move the you know, bottom 20% up to the benchmark or to our internal average, you know, in theory, we know we're going to see or we should see X amount of dollars. You know, we could start to think realistically and say, well, what if we could just get 20% of that? What if we could get 30% of that? What if we can only move of the, you know, in this case, physicians, what if we can only move three or four of the physicians halfway? We can still calculate and quantify that number and then use that to create an ROI. If we can only get 30% of the improvement, what are the dollars we might see? And then how do we use that to potentially fund additional training, management, or resources around that? In doing so, as we look at performance opportunities using data, we can then estimate an ROI. It then really shifts from should we do this project to when should we do this project because we, we can realistically calculate what the return should be. Taking that just one step further, research has shown when that projects that are taken on have an ROI or a target as a goal, the likelihood of success is significantly higher, which doesn't surprise me at all to hear that. <laughs> Let's now tie ROI, though, with analytical intensity, see if we can tie a couple of these key topics together. Um, organizations that are, you know, looking to summarize their trending data and they're trying to use that to do performance improvements, um, you typically see a reasonable ROI. There's still value there. We know where we are. We know we want to improve performance so we can move forward. Um, we can also look at automating some of the manual processes we do, and there's some level of ROI we'd find there. But you'll notice when we start benchmarking or relating data or projecting performance, the ROI tends to be dramatically higher, not just two or three times higher, but five or 10% higher. And, you know, I always like to say, if you were to take something like denials, which has the biggest impact on an organizational's performance improvement, if we could just improve denials by even one or 2%, the impact on the organization is significant. And so if you were to have better data to better manage that those changes, to better understand how to focus those teams, the impact could be huge, you know? And so that's where you start to get some justification for investment in analytics and where there's such a significant ROI. Very impressive. So now let's discuss ways you can actually evaluate your current analytical intensity. So the first thing you may want to think about is do your users actually have the data that they need? Sounds simple enough. And is it actually readily available? 
Another is to consider, does your existing data software tool or tools allow users to apply and fully integrate benchmarks effectively to measure performance, engage where we're excelling, or perhaps where there may be opportunities for improvement? Yeah, another key area is system automation. Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, because system automation could be, you know, we're manually creating dashboards uh, for physician comp and trying to mail them out. It's very time consuming. Um, you know, can we better automate taking away manual processes um, and organizations that are data driven? This is a key focus. Let's say we're collecting data. We run five, six, 10 reports, or we're, we're using sort of those legacy tools that we have that came with our EHR. Um, many organizations then that don't have any automation, they collect data, then they have to blend it manually. Usually with Excel, they might even be blending data in Tableau, but it's still somewhat of a manual load and collection of data because they don't have the ability to blend data together. And then ultimately, once they've got it blended and they create those custom metrics, which aren't calculated for them, they don't have a lot of data governance, then they start to deliver data, which again, may be somewhat manual in process. Because of all that touching uh, with hands, the, uh, the integration or lack of integration um, and manual processes, you know, it's both time consuming and, and prone to errors. One of the biggest challenges we hear then with organizations that are sort of doing everything by hand is, you know, then we have to do it again the next month. So we have people that potentially are should be analyzing data. We want to be focusing on performance improvement, but instead, most of their time, they're really just writing reports, publishing reports, and then rewriting and republishing the same reports. So organizations that are data-driven, they understand the value of investing in technology, and they look for solutions. One of the solutions, and, and I shout out to all the PDS customers that are here today. You may be familiar with our Toll PDS Dash which is a very simple way to blend data that you might be doing manually in Excel, automate that, and then have the data bursted so it's ready for distribution is just one example of automating. Um, but in bigger organizations, maybe where you're using tools, you know, the, the question would be, do you have, you know, custom definitions for visits or encounters? Um, that you need to be able to automate because every month or every week, you're trying to manually manipulate those to get the, the data to report to your data standards. And that will be the, the, the uh, webinar topic coming up in July, um, which we'll talk about more at the end of this webinar. Yeah, I myself have been at an organization where everything was very manual, and I definitely see the benefits of having more automation and visual dashboards. And there are definitely many benefits of this. And through softwares like Tableau, Power BI, as well as MicroStrategy, by shifting to more automated processes, we're able to analyze data more quickly through ad hoc reporting, as well as analytics. And these softwares allow us to quickly make changes to our visualizations in real time so that we can tailor our data story, as I like to say. So we're able to customize it to those who are communicating to. And our visualizations allow us to see our data more graphically, to produce those eye-catching results in a multitude of different formats that are available. So a lot of benefits there. Yeah, and, you know, the good part is we see more and more organizations working with visual tools, um, you know, than, than we saw. That's definitely been a trend. Um, most organizations today, I would say, are working with some kind of visualization tool. Um, but one of the biggest challenges that we see, and that's good, is then when they need to slice and dice or explore data, they might be using something like Excel cubes, which is not the same as, you know, if they're using Tableau or Power BI from a visualization side. And then to go further, when they want to sort of get down and they need to do ad hoc reporting or detailed reporting, they're using something like business objects or, you know, IBM Cognos. So they don't have a single tool set. They don't have a single set of definitions. And ultimately, even though they're getting the information, the strategy is a little bit disjointed. Best practice organizations really look to having a single source of truth that we go back to that data governance um, and being able to work within their visualization and deliver then to the users the ability to slice and dice and do detailed reporting. And ultimately what that means is whether the user is looking at a visual report or exploring data, they don't have to stop from one tool or one canned report or one solution. They can do everything they need all in one place. 
Great. Let's look at how the single analytics tool suite can actually make being data-driven more powerful. Okay. So here we're looking at physician compensation, and this is a report that a, a, a CFO finance or, a, or leadership might be looking at. And so what we're actually doing here is we're trying to analyze both our compensation how the physicians are being compensated, what their projected salary is going to be. So down here, we're looking at work RVUs versus the actual salary paid. And ultimately, you know, using the same kind of levers we also have in our comp plan, you know, how are they performing on patient satisfaction metrics and maybe some quality goals, you know, and, and the quality goals could be as simple as, you know, do we have the right amount of patient access to keep um, patients that need appointments quickly coming in? And so we can explore through this data very easily and start to understand, you know, where the physicians in cardiology, where the physicians in family practice, how is their performance against their salary? Right away, though, when we look at internal medicine, you can see we've got a couple of physicians over here that are, you know, being paid significantly less than the others. And if we were to look at those that are our top performers on work RVUs, going back to that same area there, you'll notice right away there's one physician over here that's being paid significantly less than these others, yet is performing at a work RVU side at, at the same level. In addition, we have a couple outliers down here that are generating significantly lower RVUs. They're just barely making that 90th percentile and yet they're being paid significantly more. So that's an area where we may want to be able to address that, ensure that we're, you know, equitable in our plans. We don't want to have a physician who might get, you know, um, lured away by another organization who's, you know, promising a higher salary. We certainly don't want to lose some of our best performing physicians. You know, in addition, though, we could also look across, and again, we could look at a, at our top performing physicians and start to understand where those physicians, which of those physicians who are our top performers, are missing on their patient satisfaction scores and are not hitting some of their clinic goals. So the ability to explore data, that's key. Here we're using a visualization, we're exploring data, but let's say we want to go further. And let's go back to that trio of analytics where I want to now be able to explore individual metrics. Because our compensation reporting was built off of the details of all the key drivers in our comp plan, we could drill in and now we're in a cube. We're in an uh, OLAP analysis tool that doesn't just allow me to filter, but I can actually bring in and start to analyze data based on dimensions that we didn't have in our original visualization because our analytic solution is all built off of one data set, one standard set of governance in our metrics. And so we can very quickly start to look at different divisions, procedures, we can calculate metrics, we can bring in all sorts of dimensions until we can explore the data. So that's what our OLAP tool gives us is the ability to continue to analyze the data beyond um, you know, what, what is in our visualization. We're not having to go to another tool or ask somebody for another report. To go a little further, let's say we want to drill down on the Blue Shield charges that were performed in office in cardiology. I'll just use that as an example here. And uh, we'll just pick a month, uh, one then. Here we go. All right. So um, we want to look at work RVUs by this physician. So now we're going from that OLAP analysis, and we actually executed a query that's going to drill us down to the detail. We're now down at the detailed table that gives us the ability to look at the patients, to look at the actual procedures that were done, and we can then start to see what they're doing, where they're doing. So we have all of that data at our fingertips. We don't have to ask somebody for another report. We can even continue to slice and dice through the data um, so we can understand what's going on in the organization, right? So one tool set, be it visual, slice and dice, or drill, and that's really what we're seeing best practice organizations are able to do. So they've got everything they need sort of in one place. What's really in is interesting from that same, those same data sets, we can actually construct additional visualizations and change our perspective or the context that we're actually looking at the data. So previously we were looking at comp from a management position, but now we can actually look at it from our physician's perspective. So they have all the same drivers from the previous dashboard, but here physicians can actually see their own individual performance, which is huge. 
and they can see where they are, how they may be able to self-edit, as we've discussed, their performance to improve the measures that contribute to their projected positions comp, the same information that their management is able to, to view. Yeah, and so if you if you look a little further, obviously we're showing their calculated comp here, they're projected where they're going to be. And then ultimately, though, we go back to those same key drivers. If an organization has more of an RVU-based plan, we want to be able to show the physicians how they're performing, how they're performing against where we want them performing. These could be internal or external benchmarks. So we have this very simple dashboard. And you'll notice we picked up charge lag, coding, scheduling volume, patient satisfaction. But even here, through our automation, we're able to automate and categorize those denials that are physician related, that if the physician was potentially doing a better job with coding, um, would allow you know, better reimbursement to the organization. So really showing a complete picture to the physician of what's going on. Absolutely. So to summarize, there are definitely some best practices that we can adopt to push toward board growth. As an organization, we can make sure our tools and our systems in place allow for self-service as well as quick access to our data. We can look to system automation and data visualization to help us better organize and understand that data. And then we can actually integrate internal and external benchmarks so that we're able to increase our analytical intensity, perform relationship analysis, and project those outcomes that help us to drive continuous improvement. So it's really important to make sure through all this that your analytics strategies are in sync with your users' needs and in sync with your organization's needs as well. A positive healthcare culture is the foundation of effective decision-making, and it fosters collaboration, it fosters patient-centered care and continuous improvement, as we've mentioned several times, and the well-being of both providers and patients. So all the topics that we've discussed today are strategies you can apply to cultivating a data-driven culture at your own organization. Great. With that, again, thank you all for joining us today. Thanks for tuning in. Caitlin, thank you for presenting with me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks and um, Russell. And uh, with that, again, thank you for attending. We hope we'll hear from you or see you again. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Take care.